This is the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Accelerating Your Career, where each week we talk to some outstanding individuals who've used principles from my book, Seven Rules of Power, and from the class they may have taken from me, either online or at Stanford, to build for themselves a career of impact and influence. And today we are joined by Laura Chow. Uh, Laura is a general partner at Canaan Partners. She is made partner quickly. Uh, she was a star in the course and is really has, I think, a very, very, very interesting story to tell. A story, number one, about her own background and where she came from and, and her origins and some of the interesting things that she had to do to really uh, do well given those origins. And then we're going to talk about her activities in brand building, which have been extraordinary. Uh, so Laura, thank you. Welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast. And why don't we begin by you telling about your growing up and your background and what you had to do to, in some sense, get out of your own way and really lean into the power that you now have. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, Jeff. It's such a pleasure. To set the context, let me tell you a little bit about my parents and my family. My parents were not just immigrants, but they were refugees from Vietnam. So they were fleeing a war-torn country in 1975. And they ended up coming to America and settled in a predominantly white town where no one looked like us. The customs and everything were different. And so for them, everything was about survival. Success was not about how do you have the biggest impact on the world or the largest sphere of influence or the largest bank account? It was really just about having a life where you didn't have to worry about fulfilling your basic human needs and a life where you would feel comfortable. And for them, a big part of that was how to not be a target of discrimination. The whole approach was don't ruffle any feathers, keep your head down, work hard, don't get noticed because when you're noticed, you open yourself up to becoming a potential target. But work hard enough that your pure merit would allow you to reach a certain level of stability. My parents definitely believed in meritocracy. They believed in hard work. And I fully understand why they did and where that came from. And it was really critical to how I was raised and how I grew up. I even remember when I was getting ready to go to college, I was 17, and my dad pulled me aside and he said, you know what I worry about with you? Your problem is that you're too ambitious. And he told me that, and I was like, what in the world could that mean? Like, I should be ambitious. I worked hard. I'm trying to do well in school. But it was reflective of the way they thought, right? For him, being ambitious meant opening yourself up to disappointment, opening yourself up to always wanting and not being able to find that level of happiness or stability. Fast forward to the corporate world, and a lot of those same elements were present for me. Out of college, I joined a consulting firm and I put my head down. I did the work. I was the best analyst when it came to Excel or PowerPoint or just doing the meat of deliverables. But I rarely inserted my voice in a meeting. I had this huge deference for authority or seniority. And it meant that no one ever really got to hear or see me as Laura or hear my contributions. They saw the work, but it was work that anyone was doing, right? And there is no differentiation. And I consistently got the feedback on my year-end reviews. You know, great analyst, great work, needs to work on executive presence. And I hated it. <laughs> I hated it because I would look around and I would look at these partners or uh, managers. And to me, they were just blabbing, right? They they didn't know as much. They were just speaking and taking up space. And I totally railed against that concept because I was coming from this world of meritocracy and work hard and it wasn't getting rewarded. Um, so for me, it, it took a while to really understand that and identify that difference in the world. I think some people grow up understanding that the world isn't purely merit-based, some people hope that they can change it to be merit-based. And I think it allowed me to see the world has certain ways in which it works. I have certain goals that I want to achieve. And how can I best work within the current constructs of the world to be effective so that you can have change eventually? And part of what that led me to was recognizing the importance of brand and voice and 
using that as a tool, not as a be all end all, but a tool to achieve the goals that you have. And those goals could be for a much higher good, but it's you who is responsible for getting to that point of power to be able to make the call on on what gets noticed and what doesn't. Yeah, that's a great answer. And it really, I think, illustrates two very important points. One, the general point of rule one of the seven rules of power, which is the importance of getting out of your own way. I mean, you came and were raised with a script that in many respects inhibited your your willingness and your ability to do things that you needed to do. I think that's number one. And number two, I think your point also talks about how everybody, almost regardless of their background, has been raised in ways that say, I mean, it's interesting your parents said, don't be ambitious. I mean, you know, don't, Mm -hmm. you know, don't go for too much, don't want too much. And that is something, you know, ambition is important. I think, you know, there's, it's a personality dimension that actually predicts success. And so there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. And it's really interesting to talk about how, and think about how cultural and our upbringing sometimes it, with the best of intentions, because your parents obviously had the best of intentions, nonetheless put scripts in your head that were not necessarily going to be useful. So congratulations for becoming you know, who you are, a general partner at this VC firm, basically four or five years with graduating from business school, so you've done very well. You raised in your answer the issue of brand building. You've done an extraordinary job of building your brand. So I would ask you to do two things. Number one, define what what your brand is, which I think is in the consumer product space, but I'll let you define your brand. And then talk about all the various activities you are doing with your own podcast and your columns and your writing and your speaking and your conferences to build that brand. So when I got into venture, brand felt like it was even more important in this industry than in any other I had been a part of. And again, I saw all these VCs on Twitter, on Medium, everywhere, and it felt like they were just kind of speaking to take up space. And again, I said, I don't want to do that. That's not me. But I thought about what are my real goals here in venture? And my goals were to see the best possible deals, to be able to win those deals, and then steward those companies to success to the best of my abilities. And that first part, seeing the deals and being able to win those, I realized brand was going to be really important, especially for someone who was relatively young in the industry and fairly new. Brand was an accelerator to being able to achieve those goals. It wasn't brand for brand's sake, but because I had these end goals, I said, okay, I can become comfortable with putting myself out there because it's in service of this broader purpose. So brand for me within venture didn't have to be just about being the loudest voice on on Twitter. For me, it had to be about being able to be identified as a smart consumer technology investor, an early stage investor, one who had insights on different topic areas or different sectors within consumer technology, and a brand of someone who would be helpful as either an advisor, a board member, an investor, and someone that you would want on your cap table, someone who you would want in your corner. So as I started to think about how do I actually build that brand, I thought about what would a founder or an operator find value in? And one of the things we talked about in your class, Jeff, was this idea of providing resources as a way to build power. And that's what I gravitated towards initially, right? I felt like, you know, I hadn't spent decades within operating a startup and I didn't feel like I was going to be the one to give that advice necessarily, but I could bring together the right people, bring together the right resources and create that. So an example of something I did, I started a podcast called Woven, Women Who Venture, and I highlighted the stories of female entrepreneurs across all consumer categories. And this did a couple things. One, it was a resource for all entrepreneurs who are in the early stages who wanted to see those stories and see people like them who had made it and understand the difficulties they went through. For the speakers, it was a way to get their story out there and a way to promote themselves. And for me, there would be no reason for someone like the CEO or founder of Sprinkles Cupcakes to come and speak to someone just out of business school. But when I could provide a platform and a resource for her, 
it was something that she was happy to do because I was reaching more people and I was expanding that circle of impact and resource. Another example of something I did, I started doing smaller panel events and these would be focused on very specific sectors. So I would do a panel with you know, three industry leaders within media and then invite maybe 20 early stage founders. Again, a lot of these industry experts wouldn't necessarily have a need to speak to me alone, but when they could meet each other and when they could connect with early stage founders who are kind of doing the groundbreaking in that industry, it made a ton of sense and they were happy to do it. And I was creating community amongst them. I was then developing content from the insights of these speakers and I was expanding my own knowledge base so that I could be even more effective if and when I make investments in that category. And I've continued to try to adapt to the growing needs of my own brand as things are changing or as I kind of start to see new pockets of places to spend my time. During the height of COVID, when everyone was on Clubhouse, I started a Clubhouse show. It was called Hot Deal Time Machine, where we went back in time to look at some of the hottest venture back deals and what those companies looked like at the early stages. One, it was super fun for me because I got to talk to founders and VCs about some of the earliest days of companies like DoorDash, Instacart, and just businesses that are fundamental to today's kind of fabric of technology. But it also meant that I was hearing these really interesting nuggets from operators' backgrounds that I continue to get feedback from founders saying, you know, this was a really helpful insight as I've been building my marketplace company or my on-demand company. I've also really just tried to think about how to get as much mileage out of everything that I do because time is limited. So a lot of it I turn into written content. I have a Substack, Medium, and some of that just can live there and evolve. It's great for sending to other founders. It's great for getting feedback on how I'm thinking about things and having people poke holes in them. And it's also something that has felt like it was in alignment with my own brand, where it was longer form, it felt like it was researched and felt like there was real content rather than, you know, a pithy quote or kind of idea on Twitter. And don't get me wrong, there are tons of people on Twitter that I love to follow. I'm just not that person who's coming up with those fun, pithy nuggets. And so I knew it wasn't an area that I wanted to lean into. And you also, I think, have a blog or a newsletter. Is that right? Or is that included? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And so initially that started, um, it's taken a couple different forms. Initially, I started just repurposing some of the content from my Clubhouse show. And that was an easy way for me to get in the rhythm of doing it. And then I started sending just different resources that, you know, my portfolio companies might have that might be relevant to other founders out there. Sometimes it's used for announcements around different things or for events that are happening. And it's become a great an outlet and platform to just make sure people are remembering me, remembering the types of things that I'm doing. And for me, it's all about how you scale your time and scale yourself, right? I would love to be able to do one-on-ones with everyone. That's where I love spending time and I, I get a lot of energy from it and I probably show up the best there, but it's just not feasible. And if I can be top of mind for people when they think, oh, this is a company I should send to Laura or oh, this is something where it'd be great to get Laura's input. If I can have them think of me without having to have a weekly lunch, then that's great, right? And a lot of these platforms via Substack or Medium, Twitter for some, really serve that purpose. That's a great answer. Part of your, also your brand, which I would love you to spend a couple minutes talking about, because I know you've talked about this when you've come to Stanford, is your appearance. People often come to the West Coast and they decide they're going to wear the crappiest clothes they possibly can. You show up with an enormous amount of style and you're tall and you wear heels. And I would love for you, <laughs> I would love you to talk about that also. Kind of, kind of how you've incorporated, you know, how you dress and, and show up physically as part of your brand. Yeah. You know, at this point, it feels less intentional because I just like to dress up and I like to feel good and positive about the way I look. But there definitely was intention behind it at the start. I think for better or for worse, the way you show up is often either a reflection of how you handle things or think about things. 
if that's something with intention, if that's something that's detail oriented, if it's, you know, just having a unique sense of style, but also impressions are made so quickly, right? And if I can do anything to help improve that impression, because I believe that I would be a good investor, board member, whatever, and I want to increase my chances of being able to be in service of that, why wouldn't I try and dress a little bit better? The heels thing, I love wearing heels. I've always worn heels and people always give me crap about it because I'm 5'9". I'm also Asian. The average height in Vietnam for women is five foot. And so I'm already like this giant. And then with heels, I'm like six (laughs) one. So it's very noticeable. And what I started to really recognize in Venture was I was going to all of these events where I was likely the only woman or one of very few women. And when I was wearing heels and I looked nice, wasn't wearing a hoodie, people remembered me. And this was another kind of marketing or brand thing. I didn't have to worry about remembering every single person I met. Most of them just remembered me because I was that one crazy tall Asian girl (laughs) that they saw. So it made my life a lot easier because then people would remember to come to me or they'd see me at another event and say, hey, we met here. And it would jog my memory or they would remember of the 50 people that they met. Oh, there was this one person. I remember what she looked like and she had something smart to say. Let me email her. And so it's all just about short circuiting some of the legwork that has to go in to reach that end goal that I have. That's a fabulous answer. And it really, I mean, if people pay attention to what you have talked about, the various pieces work together. So you would have people on panels, you would have people on your podcast, you would use that and then to be more interested in being on your podcast. The one thing I think we haven't yet talked about is conferences and the conference circuit. And I remember you have some interesting thoughts about that. Yeah, with speaking and kind of elevating my own brand more, I used to think, okay, what is one of the easiest ways to get seen or to kind of share what I'm thinking aside from the stuff that I'm having to produce myself, right? All of the things you just mentioned, panels, blog posts, et cetera. And I realized, you know, I go to all these conferences and it's always the same people who are speaking. And There must be some reason to that. And what I realized was a lot of these conferences are just pulling the speakers that they know from other conferences. And so I said, okay, I need to start speaking at at least one or two of these, and then I'm on the circuit. And then people will say, oh, these are the people who spoke a year ago at this event. We should get one of these people because they're pre-vetted. They know how to speak. They've been on a stage before. It's the same thing with boards, by the way, right? People are just pulling people onto their board of directors from the existing pool of people who are on boards. So with the conferences, I figured out ways to just get on the circuit. And people often are waiting for someone to come and tap them. And I just started asking. Anytime I was attending, I would also say, hey, you know, I could put together a panel on this topic. I'm happy to pull the speakers here, some of the speakers I might recommend. And if there's space or if you're interested, let's collaborate on what that could be. Or I just ask, you know, do you have any spots for people within these categories? Because I'd love to share. And eventually that just kind of started to become a little bit more of a a self-fulfilling prophecy where I had to do less of the legwork. But your, your comment before around a lot of these things feeding into each other is exactly right. Because at the end of the day, my job is not just brand building. My job is investing. And I can't have all of these things taking up majority of my time. I want them to be things that once you put in the work around brand, they start to just build on one another without having to put incremental time and work into it. And that's what a lot of this stuff has been over the last few years. And it's important to understand how brand building feeds into your job. I think the comment that you made that I quote in Seven Rules of Power is, you know, uh, Canaan Partners is not Andreessen Horowitz or some huge brand itself. And so then the question is, why would anyone want to invest with Laura Chow? And the answer is because you've built a substance-based image of yourself as a knowledgeable person that people remember. Nobody calls people that they don't know or don't think of. And the phrase you've used is top of mind, which is really critical. I want to end with one question, which you can answer or not. It's up to you. And that is, can you give a specific example in which 
the fact that you were top of mind caused you to get the opportunity to see an investment that you might not have otherwise seen? Hmm. Actually, all of the investments that I've made have come from referrals. They've come from referrals from either other VCs or portfolio companies or founders. And again, I think that's the best thing. Like that's what I want to be working for me in this business. And those other VCs are sending me deals, yes, because they want to mark up on their company, but also because they know, hey, Laura's looking in the space because she just posted a blog post about consumer media. Or I know Laura has really helped her portfolio companies as a board member. I want my company to have a great steward and I trust Laura to do that. Yeah, I think every company that I have invested in has come via some sort of referral. So yes, I can think of an example and they all have been great experiences and I'm super grateful for the opportunities. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing not only uh, the, the story about how you built your brand, but I think the story about how you had to get out of your own way and lean into your ambition, I think is a story that many, many, many people can relate to. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please subscribe uh, to listen to future episodes or for that matter, past episodes where we have these really interesting people talking about building power and influence uh, to accelerate their career, but also to get things done. And for more information, visit my website at jeffreypfeffer.com. That's Jeffrey and the last name is P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. And to further your career, check out my latest book, Seven Rules of Power. Laura Chow, it has been just a joy uh, to see you and to talk to you. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me.